Hello, my name is Steve D'Agostino, and my co-presenter Anne Fernald and I welcome you to Building a Community of Practice Through Podcasting. In 1968, Andy Warhol said, in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. While this didn't exactly come to pass, it does seem that everyone has a podcast, or at least everyone wants to start one. Podcasting has proliferated due to the low technological barriers to creation and streaming, granting the ability to become broadcasters to just about anyone. While many have achieved fame through podcasting, this mode of broadcasting has really interesting implications for creating local communities of practice in teaching and learning institutions. By shifting the focus of discussions to local issues, podcasters can share experiences from a broad array of constituencies supporting your learning community, helping to build empathy and broaden perspectives. At the beginning of social distancing, we decided to create a podcast to share our own personal responses as both instructors and faculty support personnel. The initial conversations were about the various losses we, our students, our colleagues, and our university were experiencing. Soon we decided to invite others to join our conversation. These conversations help to inform the university community of the work being undertaken to continue our mission of teaching and learning. Perhaps more importantly, these conversations build empathy and understanding, helping members of the university experience the pandemic as part of a community rather than as an individual. We soon realized that we were attempting to build a community of practice, a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. The community of practice model has been useful in describing both the processes and benefits of committed people working together to collaborate around common values and goals. Podcasting builds upon this model, creating a virtual community of practice, expanding participation and impact. What are some things to think about when thinking about a podcast of your own? A good place to get started is to think about your mission and values. Why do you want to create this podcast? And who is it for? And are you the best person to do it? Creating a podcast requires really a variety of skills so sometimes the person with the idea may not be the best person to carry it through. But you really need to understand the why behind it. What is the podcast trying to accomplish? We started our podcast at the beginning of the pandemic as a way to build community in the absence of our physical presence. We wanted to have public conversations to share our hopes and fears about teaching during the pandemic. We also wanted to give people information and updates about what was happening at the university. We also wanted to talk about what we were doing in our classes to support our students. It's really helpful to find a partner. The key to an interesting podcast is the coming together of different perspectives. So it's important to bring someone into your project who has a slightly different perspective or viewpoint from you. Now, remember, we're talking about building consensus. Our podcast is not controversial. We don't argue. But it's, it's helpful to look at things from a variety of kind of perspectives to give a broader understanding of what's happening. The goals of your podcast are really important to understand. Once you know those goals, that'll help you identify topics and guests. And those goals, quite frankly, can change over time. Our podcast initiated just with me and my partner, Anne, talking about issues that we were concerned about at the start of the pandemic. But it quickly kind of morphed into identifying people that we wanted to interview about what was happening at the university. So we interviewed deans, we interviewed people from guidance and psychological support services, from the Office of Disability Services, facilities, a variety of faculty members. We interviewed students. So we tried to get a broad array of perspectives and clarifying our goal of building community and keeping people informed really helped us do that. So structurally, it's important to create a schedule. And you don't want to be too ambitious. We started saying, well, we're going to offer two episodes a week. And quickly that proved to be almost impossible. First of all, it's really a lot of work to create a podcast episode. And then you have to book people and when are they available. And that episode has to be edited and, and made public and captioned. There's a lot of work that has to happen. So you need to be mindful of the work involved. So pick a schedule that you think you'll be able to adhere to. You want to create an episode structure. How long is an episode? Shorter episodes are easier to manage from your perspective and to consume from your listener's perspective. So we keep our episodes to about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the interview and how it comes out in editing. 
we book people for a 60 minute interview and we edit that down so you have to be aware that they, that takes some time to to do that you want to verify that the administration is supportive of your efforts there may be some topics some conversations that the administration doesn't really want to you to talk about in a public forum but it's helpful if they have buy-in because also they can help you promote the uh, podcast to the internal university or school community and that's really important and once you have the administration imprimatur you'll be able to get more guests and people will feel like oh this is really a valid thing i want to be part of this for us it was really important to name our podcast we call our podcast twice over it comes from a quote to teach is to learn twice over and naming the podcast really helped conjure it into being like magic words of a sort and we began to talk about it as if it were a real thing. Hey, we need to work on twice over. We need guests for twice over. And that really helped kind of focus our attention. And because it was new and, and real in that sense, we nurtured it and really cared about it and wanted it to grow. And we still do. Our podcast is internal, as I mentioned, and it's promoted through a university teaching listserv. But we also have a blog, a SoundCloud, and a Twitter account. I'm really, it's not so active on Twitter. It's something we should probably do a bit more of. We also stream on Spotify. I'll talk a little bit more about these in depth later in this video. But for now, you need solutions for these four technological areas recording the podcast editing it sharing it and making it accessible with captioning a few audio recording solutions are readily available we use zoom we started with skype we tried google hangouts um, we settled on zoom because we have a university zoom account um, and Zoom also offers some really good solutions for getting the audio separate from the video. So we're using conferencing tools because we are remote, right? Ann and I are both in two different locations. And also our podcast guests are, are remote. We don't have a podcasting studio, although the university is looking at putting something like that together as podcasting becomes more popular. I'm sure you've all seen this before many times, but this is the recordings tab. Um, it's in my Fordham University Zoom account. And you can see here, here's a recording from our podcast. So I'm just going to click on this to show you what we get. So Zoom provides a number of different options available for download. The most useful for our perspective as current or future podcasters is the audio only option. So the audio only option allows us then to edit that audio. So now that we have the audio, we need an audio editing solution. Our preferred audio editing solution is Audacity. Audacity is a free open source audio editing tool. I've been using Audacity, it must be 15 years. It's really a wonderful tool. I'll show it to you momentarily, but you want to be sure to download the lame encoder. It's a plugin for audacity and it lets you export your edited audacity files as MP3. It's very simple to use. So this is audacity. It does a whole lot of things, but so this is audacity. It does a whole lot of things. But for our purposes, really, it's an editing tool. It's all kinds of special effects you can do. There's a whole world of Audacity. But it, basically, you import your audio by going to File, Import. You'll notice you can also import video. So I mentioned before the Zoom benefit that you can download audio files. But let's say that you don't have Zoom or you don't have audio files, you have video files. You can import video files and Audacity will just convert them to audio files, which is really neat. To edit Audacity, right, you're just going to highlight and cut and paste or move around the way you would do with a text file. So it creates this like waveform that is a visual representation of the sound. And after a while, you can get pretty good at it. So it's really easy to use. And as I said before, it's open source and it's free. And then when you're done, you're just going to export it as an MP3. And then you're good to go. You can take that MP3 file and share it widely. So this is the Audacity page where you can download it. And there's an encoder you need to download as well to export to MP3. But it's really, really simple to use. So here's the twice over blog. It is a WordPress blog. New episodes appear at the top. It's season two. So we've made um, over 30 episodes at this point. 
We started over a year ago. I made this little logo. It appears at the top of the blog and the newest appear first. So you can see the episodes are embedded from SoundCloud. We have captioned versions on YouTube. And sometimes we have like show notes and additional links. We embed additional information uh, about the episode, things we talk about, information our guests want people to know about. So this is the twice over blog. Why do we use YouTube? Well, we use YouTube because it provides captions. And that's really important to make sure that our podcast is accessible to all users. The workaround to get audio files into YouTube is called Tunes to Tube. It's very simple. You just sign in with your Google credentials because your Google sign in has an associated YouTube channel and it happens automatically. And when the process is done, it gives you a link to that YouTube video and YouTube will process that video and caption it. The captions aren't always perfect, so you may want to go in and make some edits to them. Apart from YouTube and the blog, our podcast is also available on Stitcher. So this is accomplished through RSS, right? Really simple streaming. It creates a feed. We push it out to Stitcher as well as to Spotify. So SoundCloud is really the primary hosting environment for the audio files. So once I upload the audio file to SoundCloud, right? I also upload an image with our little logo. It will allow me to embed the podcast in our blog site. And as I mentioned before, it pushes out the RSS feed to Stitcher and Spotify. I thought it might be helpful to listen to the introduction to a podcast episode. Each introduction is very similar. It's a script read over music. Each podcast episode also has an outro. The outros don't change the way the intros do, but it's the same music and a script that's read over it. Luckily, my sons are musical and they recorded the music for us for the podcast. That solved the problem of identifying music that doesn't require copyright. You don't have to use music. You can use a sound effect if you can't identify music to use. But I think a formal introduction is really important. Hello, my name is Steve D'Agostino, and my co-host Ann Fernald and I welcome you to the Twice Over podcast, because to teach is to learn twice over. In this episode, Vulnerabilities and Liabilities, we discuss a chapter from Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks. I'd like to play you now just a short sample of the podcast so you get a sense of the tone that we strike in the podcast. And finally, you'll get to hear my co-presenter Ann Fernald's voice. Today, we're talking about Bell Hooks' 1994 book, Teaching to Transgress, specifically a chapter in that book, which is called Building a Teaching Community. That's so much of the work that we've been doing in the past 15, 18 months and the work that we hope to continue to do. And so I thought it would be interesting for us to talk about it. I chose this chapter in Teaching to Transgress because, I mean, for maybe obvious reasons, because it's a dialogue between Bell Hooks and um, male professor Ron Scapp. And they talk a lot in that dialogue about their mutual commitment to equitable, inclusive, accessible learning environments and what that looks like for Bell Hooks as a black woman teaching largely at private institutions and what it looks like for Ron Scapp as a white man who's teaching at uh, public institutions that are largely uh, serving first-generation students. And so how can people with different identities be committed to the same goal? And so it's, you know, there's a lot that's of interest, I think, for the conversations that we've been having for this chapter. But I'm wondering, Steve, what you thought about this dialogue? Um, what struck you? I imagine that you may have a bunch of questions, which I'm hoping that you will share in the Play Posit discussion space. Anne and I thank you for your attention in accessing this video. We hope you found it both useful and enjoyable. We're asked to share that if you evaluate sessions, you have a chance of winning a $25 gift card. So we're hoping that you will evaluate our session and provide us with your feedback.
Thanks very much.